This is the World Innovators Podcast with your host, Donna Peterson. I am so happy to be here today with Meryl Loeschner from Smith Douglas Associates. Meryl has been our podcast producer since we started. And every marketing meeting or webinar I listen to, the issue of a podcast comes up. It comes, how can a podcast, how can brands use podcasting? Should they monetize it? Should they be guests? Should they have their own podcast? So I thought it'd be great to have Meryl to talk about all those issues with us. But before we get started, my name is Donna Peterson, and you are listening to the World Innovators Podcast. I sit down with industry, business owners, and executives. I talk about their industries, about their marketing, what's working, what doesn't work, what they see the trends will be for the future, and maybe some tips on how we can all do things a little bit better to get the response we're looking for. So let's jump in. Good morning, Meryl. Good morning, Donna. How are you today? I am doing very well on this beautiful sunny day. It is nice out there today. You know, it's not too hot, not too cold. It's it's just right. It's absolutely the three bears kind of weather. Yes, it is. <laughs> so as I mentioned in the introduction, every marketing meeting or networking event I've been on lately, the issue of a podcast comes up. And so I wanted to talk to you about podcast, podcasting, and the industry itself. When did podcasts become so big? It started probably about 15 years ago. And like most new technology, it was a bit of a niche. And it's kind of slowly took off one of the earliest groups that fell in love with podcasting with lawyers because lawyers love to talk and this was a fantastic way that they can talk and share their knowledge and become thought leaders. So usually lawyers are very, very hesitant to embrace new technology, but lawyers just fell in love with podcasting. And 2018, when I first started talking about podcasting, there were about 850,000 podcasts. Fast forward to 2021, we're at 2 million podcasts because it has taken off in multiple ways, in multiple formats, both for hobbyists, business, and B2B. So it's, it's very similar to where blogs were about 15 years ago when everyone you knew was suddenly like, I have a blog. And now it's, it's starting to become, I have a podcast. And so do you think that the space, the B2B podcasting space is too saturated at this time? Not really, because especially with B2B, it's, it has to be a specific focus, i.e. something that the market had has good stories, i.e. business to business that's more transactional. There's really not that much you can say where in something that is a service or something that is a complex product that needs more explaining, podcasts are great. As you know, I come from the laboratory equipment field. I spent 30 years in B2B marketing with high-end science and technology equipment that you couldn't explain in a 30-second sound bite or something. Try to do preclinical imaging was very difficult to explain to people, wherein a pipette, you can't do a half an hour podcast on your pipette. So it really depends on the complexity of the B2B market and what you're trying to reach. You know, I guess that's just like all marketing we do. The more specialized you can be, the better your messaging can be that resonates with the right audience. And oh, even absolutely. This talking, yeah. This morning I was talking to a woman who was from a bakery industry publication. So it's on the industrial side. And we were talking about the differences about B2B versus B2C and her marketing messages. 
Oh, absolutely. Because B2B is one to many, while B2C is usually one to one. When you're selling high end industrial equipment, you don't have just one end buyer. It's not one person making the decision, it's multiple people making the decision. And each of them have different needs and each of them have a different language you need to reach them through. So the, again, laboratory equipment, the end user is a, is a chemist while his boss mm -hmm. may also be a chemist, but he's got an MBA and the guy you're trying to convince to purchase this is in finance. He doesn't understand exactly what it is. He needs to understand why his team needs it and how much it's going to cost. And so you need to be able to tell your story in multiple different ways to multiple different audiences using multiple different languages. And one of the things you can do with a podcast is you can start with one buying persona and segue into another and segue into another. So therefore, each part of the audience can say, oh, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you're a member of Toastmasters, just like myself. And I've gone through that visionary communication pathways, which I found to be enlightening, really, because it's all about talking to certain people the way that it resonates best with them. You know, just like you're going to do marketing. If you want it to go towards the CFO, you know, they want to see more numbers about it. Where if you're talking to the CEO, they like to be more general in how you're presenting to them so that they, they can get the full picture. So I totally agree with what you're saying. The podcast now gives you that opportunity to change the way you're communicating so that it resonates best with your audience. Exactly, it's, it's speaking in the voice of the customer. Uh, one of my clients is a cybersecurity firm and their podcast is targeted to CEOs. So one of the things I do besides just general production is I'm also a bit of a coach. So I will listen in on the interview and if they start devolving too much into computer jargon, if they start talking too much IT, I will actually interrupt them and what's GDPR, what's CCPM? And then I will go back and edit to make it smoother, but I will constantly coach them on how not to speak too much into jargon and remember, remember the audience, remember it's the CEO. He doesn't need to know what all these computer terminology means. He needs to know, how do I protect my company from hackers? How do I make sure my people working from home have the technology they need? They don't need to go deep in the weeds of the technology. They need to know the results of the technology. Right, right. That's that's very interesting there. So would you say then a podcast can definitely be used for enhancing a company's brand and also lead generation or one or the other? Absolutely can do both, especially on how you target and how you plan to use that podcast. Many people just use podcasts for thought leadership. It's this is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we know. If you want to know more about that, reach out to me. Some others will actually do it. I call it the, the sub sub level commercials. It's kind of an infomercial, but it doesn't sound like a sales pitch. It sounds purely educational. I have another gentleman who is also a cybersecurity person who specifically targeted his, one of his podcast episodes for New York state lawyers in New York state lawyers in New York state with a certain number of things that had to worry about this very tough New York state law that was specifically went after lawyers. And he spoke for a half an hour on what this law is, how it affects lawyers and all the horrible things that could happen if you don't pay attention to this law. 24 hours after he posted that podcast, he got a frantic call from an AMLAW 100 law firm in Manhattan going, we think we need you. 24 hours after that meeting, he got a six figure contract. And that was two years ago. That one podcast is evergreen content. He's still getting calls saying, oh my God, I need to talk to you about this law. So he used that purely for not only education, but lead generation. But if you go into your podcast saying, oh, I'm gonna get so many leads out of this, that's not really what podcasts are for. People who listen to podcasts, listen to podcasts for education and entertainment. 
They're not looking to listen to your infomercial. Seriously, when's the last time you turned on the TV going, oh, I hope there's some good infomercials on tonight? So if never, <laughs> if they hear anything that sounds like a sales pitch, most podcast listeners will immediately nope out and go to one of the other 2 million podcasts out there. So you have to make sure your podcast is educational, hopefully entertaining as well, because no one wants to listen to a podcast and be lectured to. <laughs> and so you have to have something of value to say, of value to your yeah. potential listeners. That's when I tell new clients, why is anyone going to want to listen to your podcast? It's great that you have lots of things to say, but why is anyone going to want to listen to you? What is the value you're offering and what you're telling? Right. Yeah. Well, it's all about the value, you know, with marketing or really any company who is trying to hire another company, you want to make sure you're going to get some value out of them. I know when we started this podcast, it's as a thought leader because people have to know about quality industrial marketing channels and ways of doing it because people aren't being taught that. So for us, the podcast has been amazing because I have these unbelievable conversations with vendors all over the world. And I just thought it was time to share that information out there because otherwise... I don't know, marketing just feels like it's going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And it's just a, you know, a throwaway kind of profession or department. And it's not, it has to be at the forefront. So it's interesting. Oh, that absolutely. You're saying that. I, I remember working for companies that understood that. And I've worked for companies that didn't have sales and marketing. They had sales versus marketing. And yes. it, it was that, and for what you do. It's, it's the education. You can't say everything you do in a 30 second elevator pitch because it's just right. too complex and there's too many facets. And so what you get to do is not only share, this is what I do. This is what my company does, but this is my network. These are the people I have surrounded myself with. So people who listen to your podcast, not only know who you are, but know you have people around you that can help with their specific need. Like I said, we both worked with scientific equipment, scientific instruments. I always joke, I was looking for the mailing list of the redheaded chemist named Fred. Because I would talk to these mailing list companies and they say, oh, we have the minimum order is 10,000 names. I'm like, there aren't 10,000 people on the planet doing this one thing that I'm looking for. I have a mercury analyzer. I'm looking for people doing mercury analysis in the environmental field, looking for EPA 74, 73, doing it this specific, specific way. There, I'm not buying 10,000 names, hopefully hitting the 500 people doing this. Right, right. Well, that's where we come into play because we dive into those industrial areas and really pinpoint the people that are interested in it. And like you said, within our podcast, I'm interviewing some of the list owners that we deal with. So people see that these are reputable or actual, <laughs> you know, they're actual people who have reputable brands and what they are doing to keep their files compliant and opted in. And also what new ventures they have coming down the road. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, you, you know how important that's, that that's is. That's one thing I... Absolutely. People move from job to job. I don't want to be sending direct mail or email blasts or invitations to somebody who hasn't been at that particular position for like three years. And it gets very frustrating. And so find a quality list isn't always the right people. It's following the right people from job to job. And if they moved positions, are they still interested in that same sphere that I'm trying to reach them? Maybe this yeah. environmental chemist is now working for a pharmaceutical company. So he doesn't care about this product, but he may care about a completely different product. Yeah, well, especially with COVID. You know, you saw several people change their jobs or change how they received marketing messages. And you really have to make sure you are using the most compliant, updated data. You know, and I've told you this story before. You know, my father was Don Peterson. He also worked within World Innovators, and I still get his promotions. Now, he's been gone eight years. 
who is checking that data? You know? <laughs> and I am a female <laughs> because they come in, they address it to him. They think I'm a male. And I'm like, no, you know, you could go onto LinkedIn and find out I'm not a male. So, you know, you can find out. I, with a name like Meryl, I get the dear Mr. Loeckner. It's just like, <sighs> so like, seriously, <laughs> I'm the only me on the planet. You Google my name. I'm the only one who shows up. This shouldn't be hard yeah. to do a little research. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Oh, I was about to say that is another good thing about having podcasting content out there because people who want to be educated about what you have to talk about will find you. Like I said, podcast episodes are evergreen content. So I got into podcasting because I wanted to learn more about ice hockey. And so I was doing some reading. Unfortunately, I just started getting doing some reading right before the Stanley Cup final. And the minute that happens, all the writers go, okay, that's the season. See you in September. I'm like, I'm not done yet. So at Wait, that time, I want more. <laughs> at that time, I was a director of marketing for a law firm and I had an hour and a half commute each way. So I'm like, I wonder if there's any hockey podcasts and oh, oh yes, there are thousands of them. So I started to listen to like 14 hours of hockey podcasts going back and forth to work. And that's when I realized this is an incredible platform for long form storytelling for businesses. Yeah. And that's when I went up to my local chamber of commerce and said, hey, you guys should have a podcast. And I said, great idea. Go start one. And, and that was my first podcast. Oh, how interesting. And oh, so big in hockey, huh? <laughs> I still listen to several hours a week of hockey podcasts, although it, it's funny. A lot of people try to monetize their podcast, but the problem is they will just kind of plunk ads in based on what they think the audience is. So of course, anyone who listens to a hockey podcast must be a male between the ages of 18 and 45 or whatever. So I'm listening to all these weird ads about manscaping and I'm like, ah, skip, 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 <laughs> skip. <laughs> well, that brings me to that issue. That was one of our questions is about whether to monetize a podcast or not. And how do you educate or what do you tell your clients when they ask that question? Well, I ask them for the first reason, why do you want to do a podcast? Because if, mm -hmm. if you're doing just purely an informational, if you're like, my friends and I want to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> oh, absolutely monetize your podcast. You can make a couple of nickels out of that. If you're doing yeah. B2B, however, even if you're, it's a, an informational podcast, there's still a kind of commercial vibe to it. And you want other people's commercials in your commercial. So if you're talking about the importance of getting a right mailing list, do you really want to be interrupted by saving 15% off on your car insurance? <laughs> and one of the things you can do is as opposed to have commercials in it, you can put it behind a paywall. You can use Patreon, you can use Apple Podcasts, even Spotify lets you have a subscription-only podcast. But you better make sure you have a lot of followers to begin with because you're not going to build a following by making them pay for unknown content. So if you have a couple hundred followers on Instagram or you have a mailing list of several hundred thousand people, absolutely, if you have an added value, Thank you for buying my book. Now you can subscribe to my super special limited edition podcast for $5 a month. That's fine. You can do it too. But again, as a lifelong marketer, I find it a little weird to monetize a podcast because I view it as a, as a marketing tool. It's like charging people to see your ad or charging people to see your Facebook page. It's, it's, yeah. I see it as using it as a tool for education and information and even persuasion. Yeah. And throwing in an ad there for, you know, buy a new mattress or, hey, manscaping, it's just a little weird for me. But then again, I'm a commercial podcast producer. So I, I work with businesses, I work with organizations. So they kind of view commercials as anathema while others are, oh no, I want to do a podcast to make money. I'm like, 
this is this is going to take time because they they base it on how many people download your podcast and so you don't even see your first pennies until you get at least a thousand downloads every episode so you can do it but don't no one ever got rich just by doing a podcast (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I, I think definitely the thing is you, you can do it, but make sure it doesn't weaken your brand or your messaging. Mm-hmm. And for us, this is a, a thought leader, you know, it's more of an information type podcast versus selling. So that, that was when someone asked me that question in one of my, I think it was my bold mind mixer group, you know, how do you monetize your podcast? And I said, well, I'm not, I'm, that's not why I'm doing this. So mm-hmm. I guess it's up to every organization. Right. Well, for B2B, it's also the monetization comes through the education. It comes through like, like my cybersecurity guy. It's people going, oh my God, you have information I need and I'm going to pay you for it. Or you have a service I I find valuable to my business. So Mm -hmm. it's again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put a commercial in a commercial. (laughs) Right. That's a good way. That is a really good analogy there. Like you wouldn't put a commercial within a commercial. So that's something, you know, a lot of companies should think about. Mm -hmm. Now, the last question I have, well, not my last, you know, I have my favorite question for the end, but when people ask about podcasts, I know you mentioned to me when I first started, you're like, Donna, it's like another whole business. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I don't need another whole business to keep track of, but then we had so many people interested in interviewing, we decided to do the podcast. But what would you say to a brand that is doing that debate between do we have our own podcast or do we just go out and be a guest on other people's podcasts? In a way, that's almost as time consuming as well, because I work with some professional speakers and like, oh, I want to be guests on these podcasts. Well, like starting a podcast and like starting a business, you need a plan. And as part of that plan, you need a budget and you're going to need to either budget time or you're going to need to budget money. Because if you want to do it all yourself, you're going to be spending a lot of time. If you want to have other people do it for you, you're going to be spending money. So one of the things I always tell people who are especially into podcasts is, what do you hope to get out of this? You are going to either be yes. spending time or you're going to be spending money. What is the result you are looking for? If you are an author, do you want people to buy your book? Do you want people to buy your product? Do you want to people buy your service? Do you want to pe- people as a thought mm-hmm. leader? What do you want the results of what you want to do? And what is the time frame you're putting in? If you're thinking, I'm going to do three episodes of a podcast and I'm going to sell 500,000 copies of my book, (laughs) we're going to need to talk. (laughs) And so it's what I work with my clients on is I have this entire questionnaire of what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? How much time do you want to put in it? Do you want to do a weekly podcast? Do you want to do a daily podcast? Do you want to do once a month? If you want to do a weekly podcast, do you have something to talk about 52 times? How much time are you willing to put into this? And like I said, it's it's like putting together a whole business plan because it is a lot of work. So one of the things I do is I can work as a coach. If I will, I want to start my own podcast. I'll say, okay, these are the 40 things you need to do first before you launch your first episode. Little things like music and artwork and show notes and intros and outros uh-huh. and hosting and all the little niggly, niggly bit text. Microphones. What kind of microphone should you use? It's, it's there, There's all this little techie stuff that you need to think about. And then again, content. Why is anyone going to listen to your podcast? What are, what are you saying that is a value to someone that they are going to spend a half an hour a week or two minutes a week or whatever listening to what you have to say? So it, yeah. it is a lot of work to do it right. There are a lot of people out there that are just, I'm just going to record myself and it's going to be a lot of fun. And there's something in the mm-hmm. industry called pod fade. And this is someone does one, two, three episodes, maybe four, and then kind of gets busy and, oh, I'll get back to it. And then maybe they'll do another, but then the clients are reaching out or something else is coming. So I would say out of those 2 million podcasts out there, some of them are only maybe five or six episodes and then they just died. Yeah. 
That, that's interesting. So you think the drop off is really after five episodes? It could range depending on, again, what people are doing, why they want to do it. I mean, some people, they do it once a week. It's fun. Sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes that's a half an hour. It's just a bunch of people having fun on a microphone. Other people have the structure. They're doing this. They're doing this. They're doing this. But especially when you're doing B2B, you have another business to run. So if something gets, one of my clients is a law firm and they did three podcasts and then they got busy. So Mm. they did three podcasts in one year, one the next year. And so Uh, they, they, they see it as the, we'll do it when we get around to it. And if that's the way that they're, they're never going to gather an audience, but if they're going to use it as individual bits of thought leadership saying, Hey, if you want to know more about this, you can listen to this interview, but it's never really going to be a vital part of who they are and how they get, they get their message out. Because for them, this is just something else to do as opposed to a vital part of their marketing plan. So again, it's going into it. You have to be willing to put in the work, put in the time, or you're just going to get distracted and, oh, I'll get back to it. And it we rarely ever get back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said, it's just like a business. And I saw a statistic recently, it said only, it says 96% of all businesses fail by 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have that 4% that kept it going after 10 years. And I think we all know like to own a business, which, you know, World Innovators has been 40 years to keep a business going. But even with your marketing campaign, you have to do that deep dive and get clarity into what you're trying to accomplish. You know, what are those goals and why are they your goals? Mm-hmm. You know, because that, that's a to big be question. Able to, to, and you also have to be able to, and this is a word that was way overused during the pandemic, you have to be able to pivot. If, if your marketing plan is, but this is the way we've always done it, that's, that's going to be a big problem. And, and even with content, like, like podcasts, listening to podcasts over the years, I've listened to how it has changed because people realize, again, you need to target your message. And so if I'm listening to a podcast and they're spending half the podcast talking about wrestling, I'm probably not going back (laughs) because I'm really interested in hockey and have no interest in wrestling. So it, it's okay to talk a little bit about extraneous things, but if you're, you want to remember what your core message is, why are people listening to this? And if your audience is changing, if your audience has started to migrate, if your audience has started to move, do you now want to reach a different audience or do you want to change your message mm-hmm. to follow the original audience? And it's, mm-hmm. you know, with marketing, it's never written in stone. It's always written in Etch-a-Sketch. You figure out yes, what's yeah. worked. Does it still work? Did, did it no longer work? Is it because you have to change the way you did it? Or do you just need to drop that completely and try something completely new? I still remember when I first started back in the 90s, going up to my marketing director and saying, there's this thing called the internet and we should have a website <laughs> and being told, oh, don't be ridiculous. That's just a fad. So. <laughs> It's uh, interesting what you were just saying, though, you know, about it being a fad. And I don't think anything is if you can stay and do it consistently. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's where a podcast can be very valuable for someone. Absolutely. It's becoming more and more popular now. At this point, 70% of America knows what a podcast is. And in one in five Americans listen to at least three or four podcasts a week, especially things are opening up again. People are commuting again. They listen in their car. They listen on the treadmill. They listen while mowing the lawn or vacuuming. Anytime where you don't need to use your eyes, people will listen. And more and more podcasts like this one is also video. I have a few video podcasts and I can either watch the interview or I can just listen to the sound while I'm playing solitaire or do something else. It's, it's a way to still learn and listen where you don't have to be still, where you don't have to use your eyes. You're not reading, you're not watching, yes. you're listening and yes. absorbing. 
I'll, I'll listen to some podcasts as I'm working. You know, if there's a marketing podcast I really wanted to do, if I'm doing something that doesn't need 100% of my attention, I'll do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then I think Absolutely. what would really help people as they go into the podcast space is to try to specialize just like, you know, everything else we've talked about. And I know as a business owner, that's kind of scary because you want to, you want to get business from everybody. You know, you don't want to say, Hey, I don't want your business. That's not my area. But I think in the end it pays off, but it's a scary thing for a company and one good to do thing at the about beginning. One good thing about a podcast is one episode. You talk about this one niche. Your next episode, you can talk a slightly different niche. The third episode, you talk a other specific, other different niche. My cybersecurity guys, again, one was talking, this is for lawyers. He did one episode, this is for insurance companies. He did another episode, this is for financial, for financial advisors. And then he was able to take that content and market it to those groups. So yes, you want to have a podcast where people can listen to multiple episodes, but you can also take each individual episode and market it as its own content. Yes, good, good. Well, I think this has been very valuable to talk to you and to find out about the podcast space, how a company could use it to be, you know, enhance their brand and also to gain leads. But before I say goodbye to you, I need to ask you my very last question. And as you know, I am big in the health and fitness space. And I think in order for us to be innovative at work, we have to stay physically active. So what does Meryl do to keep herself physically active? I like to walk. I find it not only, you know, good for the body, but it's a good way to cleanse the mental palate. If I'm working on a project or something and I'm feeling a bit stuck, I'll just unplug and go for a walk. Sometimes listening to a podcast, sometimes listening to music, other times just listening to birds and garbage trucks and whatever else is going around. <laughs> and it's just a way to kind of hit the, the reboot yeah. button in my brain. So when I go back to work, I'm like, oh, oh, this is much easier now. I, I, I totally agree with that. There's been so many times where I've been stuck on a project that is taking much longer. And it's not until I finally step away for a few minutes that it's almost like you have that ah, moment where, you know, then you understand you come, it all. Yeah. You come back, it's like, oh, well, that's obvious. Why didn't I see that for the past three hours? So it's it's cleaning that block. It's It's getting another perspective. It's like, oh, oh, this is obvious. <laughs> It makes me think of that old V8 commercial, like, I should have had a V8. It's like, I should have gone for a walk. So. <laughs> exactly. Well, Meryl, I want to thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. I think everyone learned a lot from it, and I hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Have a fantastic week. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the World Innovators Podcast. For more information about today's topic, email us at dpeterson at worldinnovators.com or call 860-210-8088. And please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a future episode.